but okay, while we're getting to things, yeah, that's easy. So. All right, I have Pat Meehan with me here, uh, current senior, former junior. Uh, we're talking about a case from about a year ago that has finally gotten finished and um, some things that happened during the acute care process as well as after acute care um, with the patient. And with that, I'll let Pat explain what happened with the case. Awesome. Hey, guys. Um, so this was probably my first patient in acute care. Um, I was obviously had a lot going through my mind, but uh, this case is pretty cool because it kind of shows you a lot of different, uh, you know, logics of thought I had throughout the case and also shows you how, you know, it almost took a year to progress through the whole thing. But uh, first off, this patient, medical history wise, uh, she came in in some pretty significant pain. Uh, her chief complaint was that she had pain in the lower right and it was sensitive to cold and chewing. Uh, medical history wise, she was a controlled hypertensive patient, which her blood pressure stayed pretty consistent. Throughout the year I saw her, um, she did have very high dental anxiety in the chair, so that always elevated her blood pressure, so we always had to keep that in mind. Um, but it was cool to see as we went that that slowly went down based on comfortability from appointment to appointment. Okay. Um, so first thing we did is I uh, started with some pulp tests uh, as we'll get to the radiographs we'll see tooth number 31 uh, had a noticeable lesion just uh, that could be clinically seen carious lesion carious lesion yes yes that could be clinically seen so uh, we obviously pulp tested that 31 but we also pulp tested 30 and opposing number two because uh, she said the pain to chewing we just want to make sure the opposing tooth uh, wasn't an issue with it. So as you guys can see here, uh, the pulp tests were a, not contradictory, but a, you know, not a f definitive answer. The cold was, she was kind of feeling it, but kind of wasn't. But our EPT being an 80, meaning that the nerve was non-responsive, kind of gave us more of the idea that the pulp was necrosed. And the sensitivity to percussion and biting uh, being very high, I remember her being very sensitive, both of those indicated that this was definitely our suspected tooth for the day. So you kind of narrowed it in on, yeah, 31's the tooth we're talking about. This is our most symptomatic tooth, the chief complaint for the patient, but it's questionable about what's the pulp status and had significant caries in this tooth, right? Yes, yes, caries were deep. So that was the other thing. We didn't know how deep these caries were going. Uh, you so we, did, we didn't have a, a radiograph at this Yeah, point. No, no radiograph yet. We were just like, you know, this is a tooth. <clears throat> we need to get some radiographs to see what's going on underneath. But obviously with what we have the pulp test, we had some ideas of what we thought it could be. Um, the other thing we had to think about was, you know, was this tooth restorable in the first place? Clinically, there was some gingival tissue overgrowth that was kind of invading the space of the tooth and where the caries were. So that was an issue. We also had to think about, you know, if we remove all the caries, if we you know, taking away too much tooth structure, or is this gonna be a possible extraction, or are we gonna be able to do endo with the crown? But the other thing was, is the caries would be deep too, so then crown lengthening came into play, so there was a bunch of different, um, you know, things going through our minds trying to figure out, hey, is this tooth gonna be restorable in the long run before we get too deep into this? So without radiographs yet, as a brand new junior, I, I remember this case and we've talked about it, you were kind of thinking of all of these things without radiographs yet. And so if I remember correctly, you were kind of wondering if the tooth was restorable and talking about maybe extracting it automatically before we even had the radiographs. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I kind of was obviously, you know, as a junior, you're trying to make your decisions and you want to make them quick and you obviously want to, um, you know, feel like you're making the right decision and you think you have enough information. But uh, yeah, I was definitely kind of, way more laser focused on, oh, this thing's going to be, need to be extracted because it's way too big, or um, also the assumption that just because a patient is in acute care, they can't, um, you know, they they won't want to do the more, how, the more time and cost yes. Uh, heavy yes, 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 yes. item. So yeah. yeah, not making the assumption that the patient doesn't want to restore the tooth. You don't know until you get all the information and present it to them. Exactly, and as a junior, you really want to focus on the important stuff. You got to make sure that um, you know. You make sure that you have collected all your data. And make sure you have your radiographs, and don't try to overthink on things 
just because you know just because you want to see one thing you shouldn't automatically come to an answer make sure you get the whole picture and come up with a conclusion before you start jumping to your own occlu- yeah. conclusion so something i stress to you guys all the time of all right you make this assumption now prove that it's true or not so assumptions are great if they're right but if they're not right and you can't prove it and that leads to some problems and also don't and also don't fudge <clears throat> things to prove something that you want to believe is true trust Absolutely. the numbers and be able to read them i know i've seen it where people are like ah the cold test yeah it's probably necrotic but you know if you do it a second or third time you might get a response and you really want to make sure you're recording accurate data so you can have an accurate conclusion not just a conclusion that you want to see because that's what you think it is sure and you don't want the patient to conclude something that you're leading them to tell you that might not be absolutely true. absolutely so did pulp test talked about things got away from the is it restorable non-restorable track um, until we had the radiograph and said okay we know it's 31 let's look at where is this carries how deep does it go where do we go from there perfect so we took a bite wing and a pa which i think originally i just took the bite wing and kind of looked at rad like yep this will do this is the, you know that's the tooth and kind of came up with an issue or came up with an idea and rad said well you don't know about the apex as a junior i thought we just needed the one radiograph so i think we went back and took the uh, pa as well um i came back and my first conclusion was to rad since your is a slight radio lucency, but nothing that at the time, you know, I can see the radio lucency now, but at the time I didn't know if that was enough to be, uh, indica- to indicate that there was apical pathology on this tooth. So my first thought is when I saw the, a lot of sensitivity to the biting uh, and to the percussion in that tooth, and then I saw this little line that, can they see the mouse doing that? Okay, so where this, his mouse is going over, I thought that was a fracture line, almost like a, um, just, it was a fracture that was coming right through the tooth. So my first thing is I came to Red and said, especially with those mandibular second molars being very common for cracked tooth syndrome, I go, oh, it's cracked tooth, Red. Got it. You can see it right there, clear as day. That would explain the percussion, the sensitivity, this tooth's cracked, like it's it's got to come out. Um, so we had a conversation then about, you know, look at both pictures, and if you look here, the chamber is really, really, really small from a mesodistal standpoint. So the chamber on this tooth is li- really right here, and this is just one of the mesial canals going into that root. Yep, so as we compared them, as we kind of saw, um, it was a good lesson for me to say, hey, you got to remember that these radiographs, there's angulation errors or inefficiencies, and that's why we take multiple pictures to make sure we're getting the whole picture uh, of the tooth just to, you know, just so we don't start running to conclusions again, you know, make sure you gather all your information and, you know, if you come to a conclusion, make sure you have evidence that checks out. So I know for me, this was really cool to, you know, think that I came to a cool diagnosis at the time, but, or not cool, but an interesting diagnosis. But, um, in reality, you know, once again, stepping back, looking at the whole picture to make sure you come to a correct diagnosis. So at that point, we were saying our probe depths are in normal limits. We don't really have evidence of a um, root fracture or a crack. We have distinct caries that goes to the distal pulp horn radiographically, possibly an apical lesion, high EPT. We're thinking this is probably a necrotic tooth. Maybe can't 100% prove it, but we've got caries that goes to the pulp, and we need to get the caries out to, one, look at if it hits the pulp, or also restorability issues and where we're going with that. So what did we do? Then. So my next thing is, I believe what I said next is after we had this conversation, I told the patient, hey, listen, you know, first thing uh, we want to do is if the restorability is questionable. What we're going to do is we're going to go in there and remove the caries and kind of reevaluate the tooth to see, A, how deep this is, B, how much tooth structure we have, uh, and then kind of reevaluate. I had informed her that if we are able to save this tooth, it's going to be. It's going to need a root canal. It's going to need a full coverage crown, and also based on the distal aspect that you could tell in the X-rays, we might even need crown lengthening. So before we even went to try to save the tooth, I just wanted to explain to her that hey, you know, this is this is these are kind of your options that are extraction. But the patient elected to hey, you know what, let's give it a try. Let's get the caries out and let's see what's left. And if you think that it's restorable, I would really like to keep this tooth. So uh, we looked clinically in the mouth. This is what we had. Our next thing, my next big issue was, okay, well, we got the caries out. I need isolation. And with that gum tissue overhanging into the tooth like that, 
isolation is going to be an issue. So um, rubber dam couldn't really use because we had all that tissue overgrowth and also we're getting so close to the gingival margin there. Um, we had to get an assistant to use a high vac suction so we could do all the caries removal. Knowing that we were doing just caries removal before worrying about a pulpal debridement and all of that. Yes. So knowing that we need a rubber dam eventually, but we need to get the caries out and isolate the tooth somehow so that we can use a rubber dam on it. So <clears throat> we already talked about this a little bit. We talked to the patient about, hey, you got three options here. Root canal build up crown with possible crown lengthening. Today, a diagnostic caries removal and a pulpal debridement and then back for a comprehensive exam later. Second option, extract. Third option, no treatment. Not a great option, but always an option for patients to choose. Can't put a rubber dam on predictably here. We could probably get a clamp, but we didn't have great um, ability to get the caries out on the distal with a rubber dam there. So, as Pat said, worked on getting caries out with an assistant and proper isolation as best we could. Still unknown on what the pulp status exactly is. Regardless, we're getting darn close to it and still have a little bit of caries left to go with. Yep, there, there we just cleaned the DEJ out. Red took a look. We got another picture. So as you can see, you're starting to see a clean DEJ, but also you're starting to see the uh, caries that's still heading toward the pulp there. Yep. And then we have definite bleeding from gingival manipulation on the distal where isolation is going to be, again, a challenge. So here's our next uh, image this is with all the caries the gross caries are all removed now as you can see on that distal we had to take a little bit more of that tooth structure off so I you know we're almost hanging underneath the gingival tissue now um, and we got bleeding controlled but yes bleeding controlled nice dry area so you know at least at least we know now that okay well we got it all out um, I believe at this point I was able to stick another number 10 file into that little distal canal that in a later picture you'll see we kind of widen because we knew we were gonna have to do endo eventually. But so I knew we had gotten to the pulp and um, you know, and at this point- we, No bleeding. Yeah, no bleeding. So we kind of could come to the conclusion that the pulp was necrosed, necro or necrotic pulp once we got to this aspect. And we got a carious pulp exposure. So we knew we needed endo for multiple reasons. The tooth was probably necrotic. We got carious pulp exposure that confirmed we had a necrotic pulp. Um, just a lot of things pointing to, hey, this is a tooth that needs a root canal. And along the way, we were able to prove it more and more and more. So you put a nice uh, matrix on here and got really good isolation on the distal. Yep. So what, what did you do then? So yeah, the whole point of, so we were able, once we were able to isolate it and have a nice clean field, we know our next step is eventually endo, as Rad just mentioned. So we have to build this tooth up somehow because when we go to go to endo to do the root canal, you need to have to put you have to be able to put a rubber dam on the tooth. So our next aspect was well, we already have that distal canal as you can see, but we also want to build this tooth up. So what we went to do is we ended up putting a little cotton pellet right over that canal. So when I were to re-enter that tooth in the coming weeks, I was able to find that distal canal easily and work my way up easily to find the. Uh, mesial buccal and mesial lingual canals with that tooth. So yep. you kind of saved your spot and then put Fuji in on the yep. distal to make a temporary that would be rubber dammable as well as keep good isolation once you got some Absolutely. Chloride in the and tooth the and Fuji was great too because since we were getting really close to the gum tissue and that margin, that Fuji gives us a nice seal so we know that we're have we're gonna have complete isolation once we do the full endo. So as you can see in this picture, we built up that whole distal half of the tooth. Uh, you could see that we were able to get a clamp on it now because we now had tooth structure to be able to clamp on and we were able to put the cotton pellets on that distal canal. So when I went back to do the endo on that tooth later, I knew exactly where to drop into. I found that tissue, or the uh, cotton pellet, pulled it out, and then was able to work measly to find my other canals. And when Pat says going back to do the endo, he's talking about the debridement that we did 10 seconds after finishing this. So same appointment. We're still there. We found the canals. Um, talk a little bit about finding these three canals. Yes. So uh, one thing that I remember before I, before I went in to finish the deprivement, Rad had told me, look at the angulation on your bite wing. That tooth is tilted slightly mesially. And, you know, this tooth, you could have very, e and those canals were very tight on each other too. You could have very easily 
kind of, or I would say perf this tooth if you would have kept following it right out that, uh, call it the mesial embrasure per se. Yeah, mesial gingival there. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Just because with that angulation, you think you're going straight down and you're going to continue to follow those, uh, or you think you're going straight down the tooth to find those canals, but especially coming in from the distal like that, you know, you can lose track of the angulation of that too. So really always looking at your x-ray and making sure you're lining stuff up is really important because, you know, it didn't happen in this case, but there's definitely times where people lose track of the angulation of the tooth and can lead to accidental perforations. Sure. So if we would have done a traditional access on this tooth and gone through from about, you know, right here in this mesial pit, you probably would have found the pulp horn, but you might not have thought of the fact that your actual orifice is pretty far distal for the mesial canals. Mm -hmm. So nice that we were able to conserve some tooth structure. That's just some staining in the groove. And while we did our debridement in our future endo, to have an, as much tooth possible to do our future crown, um, which definitely good for the patient. So we found canals started to um, widen them, um, access them with a Gates Glidden, and did a little bit of filing, if I remember correctly, but not a ton. Nice, partly yeah. due to partly due to time, partly knowing that we were going to get the patient into endo shortly. Mm -hmm. So this is what we ended up with that day. Um, took a follow-up bite wing to confirm we got a good seal on the distal gingival seat. We've got some calcium hydroxide down into the canals, and we've got a cotton pellet holding that space so that we don't have to go searching for canals when we go back in to do endo. Well, you can also see at this radiograph, because we had to take a little bit more of that distal tooth structure off, that she's looking uh, more and more like a candidate for crown lengthening. Um, so... I would, so obviously informing her before was important because we didn't know how much tooth structure we have to take away and we tried to conserve as much as you can but as you can tell in this especially in this white wing you can really kind of yeah. see that Get you're a little close have, there. yeah and as we did we elected to do the crown length thing later down the road which worked out great but um it was good for us to you know take it one step at a time and you know obviously lay out all of our options to the patient before and so she had an understanding of what all could happen and that's why we do it so you know if we do run into certain scenarios, at least we've informed the patient so they understand what they're getting into, you know, as they elect to do treatment. So we won't belabor the endo side of things, we're more talking about the acute care side of things, but did endo on this tooth, um, was able to keep that temporary restoration that was made of Fuji in there. So what Pat did lasted as long as he needed it to last, operated the tooth, and then a little timeline of you know, we saw the patient in October of 2021. Did a comprehensive exam. Endo appointments were in December. We did a buildup in January. Um, basic crown prep in January with the buildup. Temporized it. Did crown lengthening in January. Later January. Yeah. Waited for yeah, a little to, bit of healing. Two to three months. Two to three months um, because of how aggressive the crown lengthening was in tissue and making sure everything heals nicely. And eventually... Got our final crown cementation in June of 2022. So we're looking at almost an entire year for that one tooth, but patient was happy. Um, any other thoughts or learning points here for you, Pat? Yes, one thing for sure is just making sure that you know, whenever, you, whenever you're gonna explain to the patient possible treatment options, just you know, make let, let them know that the possible timeline can take a while. Um, I think that obviously you we wanna do we want to do as much as we can at the dental school, but I think we really have to portray to the patients that, hey, this is the timeline that it takes. Um, also, I guess the biggest things I took away was you got to make sure that you gather all the information and look at the big picture. I think I quickly assumed too many things throughout the process and was able to really learn that, hey, you know what, just because you come to some sort of conclusion, uh, you know, doesn't mean it's the right one and also make sure that you can prove yourself right or prove yourself wrong and try to prove yourself right or wrong because, you know, you'll get better at coming up with these diagnoses as you go. But you need experience. But you need that. the experience, yes. And honestly, the fact that there's definitely some, not mess ups, but definitely some awesome learning points along the way to say, hey, you know, you didn't look at this or, hey, have you tried doing that? Uh, I guess in this case, you know, looking at both x-rays and comparing them or, um, you know, really explaining to the patient the whole, you know, thinking about crown lengthening and other things like that. It really just, it, it, you realize that there's so many things that go into the process, but you just have to continue to think about all the possibilities that can happen down the road. And, 
you know, the more you hang around acute care, you'll learn to ask the right questions and you'll learn to kind of, you'll just, you'll, you'll hone in on your craft of really trying to figure out what the diagnosis needs to be and all the tests that come with it. Um, but besides that, um, I think that's a couple of the main points I learned. So awesome. Thank you.